We are not finished yet. We still have lots to do. Um, it was a great day yesterday. It was nice to see most of you out. I think it was a, a good success. We enjoyed the market day. I hope also that you are feeling refreshed after our week of spiritual emphasis. I think uh, many of us were encouraged. Encouraged to keep on the fight. Encouraged to draw strength from the love of our, and grace of our Savior. I want to welcome you all this morning. We wanted to prepare a few talks as we go forward, as we come closer towards the assessment, to help you to make good choices. Um, you know, when, you, when you're working on a car, you realize that uh, it's not just the engine that's important. I have, a, I have a car where the ECU gave me issues. So the ECU is the electronic control unit. And uh, we took the car in for a service. The car's 100%. Drive the car. And I don't know why it's always after the service. You stop the car, switch it off, you try and switch it on again. It won't work. So we had a mechanic come out to take a look. And he said, yes, we know what's wrong here. We need to change this cable. Change the cable, car doesn't work. It sat for two months at the mechanic's. And they couldn't fix it. So we got the car, took it out, took it to another mechanic. As it arrived with him, he said, no, no, this is not the problem. He took it next door to the auto electrician. And within about three days, the car was working again. So it may seem like the physical is working, but if the cognitive is not working, then everything falls apart. And we work the same. We have different components. We have the physical we have the intellectual, we have the cognitive processes, we also have the spiritual. And each one of these components need to work together in order for us to function well. And so today we're going to be talking about one of those components with the goal of helping you prepare for your assessments, for the exams, and also dealing with the stress that you're experiencing during this time. So as you're working towards finalizing all of your assignments, as you're working towards ensuring that you've got the DP and that your grades are, are not just satisfactory, but that they are excellent, we want to provide you with information that will help to prepare you so that you can stand in good stead. We don't want your bodies not to be working because then your brain can't be working. We don't want your spirituality to be lax because then you don't have the strength that you need to meet the challenges of life. And so in today's uh, assembly, we're going to be addressing some of those um, aspects. And I welcome you all here this morning. And thank you for taking the time to listen to the message that has been prepared for you. We'll move on now um, with our opening prayer. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So today's scripture reading will be coming, uh, the opening scripture will be coming from Jeremiah 33, verses 6. And it says, Behold, I am come, I'm going to bring to you, to it, healing and a remedy. And I will heal them, and I will reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. So this is the so let us close our eyes. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we can call upon you in times of distress and also in any circumstances we call on you. We want to ask that you will help us and remind us on, to this verse that has been read that we will remain, remember everything that has been said, and may we do everything in the glory to your name. This is my humble prayer in your name. Amen. Good morning, family. 
uh, and greetings from the SID family as well. Uh, we are going to sing a song called At Calvary because whatever we are going to do and what we do without that sacrifice, ultimate sacrifice on Calvary, it would be useless. So let us glorify the Jesus who gave everything for us on, at Calvary. Suspend in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and great. Was free, but on there was multiplied to me. There, my burden, soul found liberty at Calvary. Bye. God's words that last my sin I learn. Then I tremble at the low I spurn till my guilty soul in ploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, but on there was multiplied to me. There my burden soul found liberty at Calvary. True salvation's plan Oh, oh the, the grace that brought it down to man Oh, the mighty God that God is man At Calvary Mercy there was great and great was free, but on there was multiplied to me. There, my burden soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that true salvation's plan. 
Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty God that God is born at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Oh, oh, oh. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Then my burden soul found liberty. At Calvary, mercy there was great and grace was free. At Calvary, Amen. Thank you so much for that special item. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this morning. Um, our speaker today is uh, is not. Uh, some of you should know him. He's not a stranger to to Helderberg College of Higher Education. He has been before here to address us. His name is Pastor Foswa, um, and he's an ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He serves in the Cape Peninsula 2 um, district in Cape Town. Um, he's a very passionate speaker, and he has this tremendous love and passion for, um, for the youth. And I, I, I really enjoy the way that he um, addresses these topics. He's very passionate about health ministries, and he's spoken um, in, in, in various uh, meetings in Africa, in Europe, the USA, South Pacific, and he especially loves evangel in evangelistic meetings and health, uh, the health message. And so I want to um, welcome him this morning, thank him for coming through to address us once again, and I, I am sure that you are going to be blessed by the message that he has prepared. Good morning, everyone. God is good. And all the time. Yes, um, no matter what I do, nothing makes me more nervous than speaking to university or college students. Uh, I don't know why, but anyways, I'll be fine. Um, this morning, I want to talk about a few things. But I want to thank uh, Professor Zygmunt for the invitation and the college at large for the invitation for me to talk to you this morning, especially as uh, students are preparing. I don't know, it seems like the mic is giving me feedback. I don't know if that the fault is with me, but I'll continue and whoever is in charge of that can help fix it. Um, I'm going to share some things that I hope will help you in your preparation for your exams. But uh, if it doesn't help in preparation for your exams, hopefully it will help in the rest of your academic journey and especially the rest of your life. Um, I don't have much time with you, but hopefully in the little time that we have together, I can give you a few pointers that have helped me that hopefully can help you as well. All right. Um, first of all, I want to start by saying I acknowledge that as uh, college students, you are under a lot of pressure. Uh, you're under a lot of pressure. Sometimes you're under so much pressure that you ask yourself, what am I doing here? Yeah, what am I doing here? Why did I uh, uh, come here? I know uh, those of my uh, colleagues uh, who are in the theology faculty, especially when you are dealing with the languages, yeah, you're probably asking yourself, uh, am I really called or did I call myself? Um, of course, I'm not trying to say that other faculties don't have challenges. I'm just speaking from uh, where I will not speak ignorantly because other faculties I will speak ignorantly from. So three things I want to talk about um, this morning. The first one I want to 
for us to look at is the impact of your mental health on your academic performance and your success in life in general. And then the second thing I want us to look at is some lifestyle factors that can help uh, to, to help you both in your intellectual and also emotional development so that there's a balance between your emotional health and also your intellectual um, prospects and, and success. And then the last one we're going to look at is certain habits that can hinder you from success. Some of them you will not like me for, uh, some of them you may not mind, uh, but it's okay. Uh, yeah, I've given up on trying to be liked. I always find ways to make people not like me too much. So forgive me if I do that to you this morning. All right, so the first thing I want us to look at is the impact of our emotional health on success in life in general. A lot of people are focus a lot on IQ, um, meaning your general intelligence. Uh, your ability to learn, process, analyze, and use information. And that is very good. Um, sometimes people will, 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 will look at their IQ and say, now this is uh, the reason why I'm able to achieve this much or I'm not able to achieve whatever. And people focus on that. And by the way, the good news is that uh, even if you start with a low score in your IQ, you can always improve it by adopting good lifestyle practices that can help you improve that area of your life too. So if you are in the lower percentile, meaning below 90, for example, in your IQ, you can actually build it up. I remember hearing a story of a young man who didn't do particularly well at, um, at high school. His, his IQ was around 80. And uh, he went to this health shop that had a restaurant, and he spoke to the owner of the restaurant. And he was very discouraged, you know, depressed, you know, because he was not going anywhere in life. So after talking to this man, and the man suggested, you know, if you can do this and this and this, maybe you can improve your life. So the young man took the advice, and he started following some of the principles I'm going to be talking about this morning. And he made a decision after some time um, to go to Amazing Facts to train to be a Bible worker. So he went through their six-month program, um, AFCO, and he trained there, finished, went and did Bible work for some time. And then he came back to the restaurant a few years later, and he met uh, Dr. Neil Nedley, who, whose books I'm going to recommend to you in a few minutes. Uh, Dr. Neil Nedley is, is, um, is the president of Wima University in California. He is uh, the, 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 the president of the Nedley um, Depression Recovery Clinic and Nedley Health Solutions. And he's a very accomplished man. Uh, he's by training a gastroenterologist, so he studies the gut and um, everything that impacts the gut. Interestingly enough, he studied the gut, but he's not specializing in nutrition and all of those things. He specialized in mental health because there is a very strong connection be between your gut health and your mental health. All right. So it's important what you eat because what you eat affects your brain. As Ellen White says, there is great sympathy between the mind and the body. All right, so anyways, this young man spoke to uh, Dr. Neil Nedley and he told him, you know what, I, I know that I am a Bible worker and I didn't do well in high school, but I feel that God has called me to do medicine. Yeah, as a Christian, Dr. Neil Nedley looked at him, he didn't want to disappoint him, he said, yeah, being a physician is a good thing. Yeah, but it's, it's not necessarily for everyone, it's not like if you, if you don't become a doctor in life, you have failed in life. Um, but if you do feel called, you need to do a lot of hard work because the results from your high school and your IQ suggest that uh, you, w you will not do well in medicine if you continue as you did in your high school. So he said, no, 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 tell me what I need to do and I'll do it, but I want to be a doctor. So long story short, he told him lifestyle issues that he needed to look at, his nutrition, his exercise, and all of those things. And the young man went and did a pre-med in, uh, in the University, I think, of Oklahoma. Um, he did well in his pre-med. He started in the C's, C+. Plus. Then he went up to the B's and B+, pluses, A-. minus. By the time he finished medicine, he was an A student. Showing that just because you start at a certain level in your IQ does not mean that you are doomed. 
Um, a lot of people who deal with uh, brain health, there's a, a term that has become a buzzword now in neuroscience, which is neuroplasticity, that our brains respond to the challenges that we put them to. And our brains continue to expand and grow, depending, of course, on what we do with them up until old age. I remember in California, Dr. Wehem, who was working at Loma Linda University, he retired at the age of 95. And while he was retiring, they begged him, please, we need your steady hands and your keen eye in the operating room. He said, no, 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 I don't know how long I have to live. I need to do something else besides neurosurgeon. I've been a neurosurgeon for more than 60 years, so I need to do something before I die. He ended up dying at the age of 104, and uh, he was able to build the fence around his house at the age of 190, uh, 102, sorry. And yeah, he was still driving at 102. He was still, uh, he had a license and he could still drive because he was in good both physical and mental health. So the point that I was trying to make with all of this is that no matter where you are in the great scale, you are not doomed to stay there. You may stay there if you want, if, if, you, if you have enough motivation to stay there, but you can build up enough motivation to actually exceed what you are able to do. All right, now, first of all, what I wanted to share is that your success in life depends less on your IQ than on your EQ. Um, this has been recognized by many uh, psychologists, neuroscientists. Um, I read it uh, first time in this book that I want to recommend to you, even if you are not in the psychology faculty, but for the students who are in the psychology faculty, I would recommend this book highly to you, The Lost Art of Thinking, by the same Dr. Neil Nedley I spoke about. And I also want to re um, recommend this book as well, Depression, The Way Out. Yeah, you may not be depressed today, but uh, it might come to you sometime in your life. So I highly recommend this book. By the way, the Nedley Depression Recovery Clinic has a 95% success rate in treating the most severe forms of depression and anxiety using the New START program that was developed at Wima College some years back. But of course, some information also in psychology and our cognitive behavioral therapy and all of those things, 95%. That is the highest rate in America, and I think it could be even worldwide. So when Neil Nedley writes these books, he's not guessing, he's speaking from vast experience, both in reading and writing, um, academically, and also clinically as well. So I just wanted to recommend that for your mental health. So, so um, people who are able um, to know and understand their emotions, people who are able to control their emotions, people who are able to recognize emotions in others, people who are able to regulate their relationships, be it relationships with friends, with peers, with colleagues, and also with lecturers, and people who are able to motivate themselves to achieve goals. Those are the people that have a higher rate of success. People who have high emotional intelligence have better chances of succeeding. Remember, the young man I spoke about, he started off with an IQ of about 80. But because of applying principles and because of a high motivational level, because he had a high emotional intelligence, he was able to go from being an 80 in the score of his IQ to above 120, which is in the 20 percentile of the population and below. So the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, there are people who are very intelligent, they are very smart, but they do things to blow it in life simply because they are emotionally unintelligent. One young man who was a candidate to be a professor of psychology at a university was invited to a seminar and someone asked him a question that was very provocative and he lost it and he actually swore at the person. That was the end of his academic career. So he ended up failing in life, not because he had a low IQ, but because he had a low EQ. He was a genius from the standpoint of IQ, 
but because he did not have <laughs> good control of his emotions at a critical time, he ended up not able to accomplish what he could. So as much as you develop your general intelligence, you want to ensure that at the same time, you develop also your emotional intelligence. It's critical in school. It's important when you go to the workplace. Some people are not able to progress in their careers, in their calling, not because of how smart they are not. I didn't want to say it from the negative standpoint, but because especially of how they are unable to relate to others. And sometimes you make mistakes where you make the right intellectual decision, but you make the wrong emotional decision. I did that at a meeting. I need, let me confess my sins to you. Um, uh, this is self-therapy right now. Uh, so so, so uh, we had a meeting. There was a, a staff meeting. We were called by the administration of the conference, and this is on record. Um, and there was a point in the meeting that I did not particularly like, and I expressed myself, and I expressed myself very strongly against it. I believe that what I was saying was correct, but the manner in which I expressed it was not the best. So a few days later, after prayer and much contemplation, I had to call the president, who was chairing the meeting, to apologize, not for what I said, but for how I said it. Are we together? So it's important for us to, 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 to be able to recognize when we have made mistakes, even in how we express uh, or deliver what we need to say. So that was the most, imp that, that, that's the point. And, and this book deals with the issue of emotional intelligence mainly. When it talks about the lost art of thinking, it's addressing issues related to emotional intelligence and how our physical health also in influences um, emotional intelligence as well. So I want to highly recommend the book. All right. So we also want to look at, the second thing I said I was going to um, talk about is we need to look at our lifestyles. I know as students, you are always in a hurry. Yeah, you are going from one lecture to another. You are going from one assignment to, to, to the other and all of those things. And you feel like you don't have time. But whatever you don't have time for, have time to take care of your health. Because if you take care of your health, it will make it easier for you in the classroom. It will make it easier for you when you're in the library. It will make it easier for you when comes exams. I said, I'm sharing these things with you, and I know that they will benefit you more if you apply them, not now, maybe for the coming exams, but throughout your student life and hopefully throughout your life. There's a saying in my language that if you want to slaughter a sheep tomorrow, you don't feed it today. Are we together? Yeah, so the time for slaughtering is close. So maybe feeding the sheep or the lamb today will not help you fatten it for the slaughter. Um, but it will help you in the future to feed it so that by the time the slaughtering time comes, uh, it is fat and plump and nice and juicy. And I'm saying this as someone who does not eat meat. So please don't say that I was promoting meat at Helderberg College. I don't use it. I haven't eaten it in the past 17 years. So please, uh, I was just making, a <laughs> it was more parabolic than literal. So please don't take it literally. All right. So, so, so you want to make sure that you follow the new start. You want to take care of the nutrition. Um, take care of what you eat. Of course, according to your budget, according to what you can afford, but even if you don't afford much, do the best that you can with what you can afford. I didn't like the fact that my mother made us cook, but we were four boys. My mother, being a tough introvert, told us when we were very young, I have one husband in this house. I will not find myself having four. didn't like it. 
When other boys were playing in the streets, we were busy cleaning the house. When they were having fun, you had to be called to come and cook the evening meal. I hated it. Unfortunately, my mother passed away when I was 12. When I was doing my first year at university, I was about 17 at that time. Don't ask me how that happened. <laughs> it's because of the same tough mother. She didn't want to have a nanny for me, so she sent me to school. They said preschool, said I, I will not pay for my child to play. So that, and then I started primary school young, so it's her fault. So anyways, when I was there, and I started seeing the things that my friends were eating in the dorm, I was like, man, I thank God for my mother. I wished I could go to a gravesite and resurrect her and shake her hand and say thank you. Remember my sister, she introduced us to green salad. Yeah, by the way, green salad is a new thing among Africans, ne? Yeah, if you were born after 2000, you won't understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, but the idea of eating raw vegetables, yeah, you know. And my, you know, my, my sister was coming from, from Kabeha, so they are a bit more advanced there. I was coming from the Transkai Mtata. So the idea of eating raw vegetables was repugnant to me. And I did not like her for teaching my mother how to make that thing, because now we had to eat it. <laughs> when I was at university, I thanked my sister. I said, thank you so much. But anyways, of course, in my last years at university, I learned of the health message, because I started you know, attending the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and a year later, I was a baptized member of the church. If you would compare my grades for my first degree with my grades for my master's degree, you would see the difference. Because I started making sure that I exercise on a regular basis. I started you know, making water my favorite beverage. Um, I started understanding the importance of rest, that even if I'm, I'm pressed, let me make the most of the times that I'm awake and all of those things. So when you start implementing you know, these principles, being temperate, spending time in the sunlight and all of those things, it starts, of course, you don't see the effects and the impact now. But when you look over a long time, you start to see that, man, there is a huge difference. And I'm gaining a lot of benefits. So I would like to share with you a few tips. This thing. You can leave it in your dorm room and pick it up at the end of the day, and you will not lose anything. Are right, together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, if, you, if you need to use it for research and stuff, get a cheap, uh, what do you call this thing? A cheap tablet if you can. Yeah, leave this thing in the dorm, or if you're carrying it, put it on flight mode. Because there's no such thing as multitasking. Uh, serious neuroscientists uh, have shown that you can't be WhatsApping and Facebooking and listening to a lecture effectively. Are we together? Even if you've done it before and you have passed, you can probably do better if you switch it off. Are we together? Same as when you are studying. Yeah, put it on flight mode. It will help you a lot. Because switching between tasks prevents your brain from actually focusing and being able to absorb and analyze more effectively what you are reading. So you may be reading, but you may not be reading with as analytical a mind as you can. That's why, you know, people, you know, professors, you ask your professors, when they are writing books and they are doing writing projects, they will take sabbaticals, they will take leave, they will go to the mountains, you know, in a quiet place. They will gather all their information and go to a quiet place where they can just focus. Because it affects the quality of what they produce. But if you write, write, write one sentence, and then you get a notification from your Instagram, and then you check, like, wow, hey. This is a, and then you, you think you're going to spend two seconds on that thing, and you don't notice, you spend five minutes. So you study for three minutes, and you Facebook for 10 minutes, and then you study for 10 minutes, and then you Facebook for 15 minutes. When you accumulate it throughout the day, you'll find that you've actually wasted two hours of quality study. And even the time of study that you have gotten, 
is not of the highest quality because you were not focused. So besides you know, checking your nutrition, exercising, and all of those things, don't let this thing be your enemy. Yeah. This thing of bite-sized information, you read this information here, and you get excited about it, you read the next post. Our minds are all over the place. And people say that people are sick with ADHD, ADD, and all of that. People are not sick. They just need to learn how to focus and to remove activities in their lives that prevent their brains from learning how to focus and pay attention. So the problem is not a disease that cannot be treated. It's just habits that people need to overcome so that they can, um, they can, they can do better. Now, the part that might cause you not to like me uh, has come, and I've already apologized if I offend anyone. There are certain things that we take into our bodies that are not the best for our brain development. Yeah, one of them, I'll start with the light one, caffeine. Yeah, caffeine. Yeah, caffeine is an enemy to your brain. And don't, don't, don't say I take caffeine to, get to, to boost my energy. That's a fallacy. I used to work as an, um, as an articles auditor for an auditing firm. And sometimes we had deadlines. And therefore, for a whole month, we would sleep on average at 12 midnight and start early in the morning. That would be a good night. If we sleep at 12 midnight, it's a good night. There was a time when I was doing an audit, we would sleep between 12 midnight and 2 a.m. in the morning. And we were supposed to be at the office at 8 a.m. in the morning. My colleagues were taking Red Bull, Coke. Uh, the monsters of this world were not, uh, at least were not big. Score was not even there. And the dragons and stuff and all these scary things that people drink. But I would drink water. They said, ah, why are you not, you know. I said, no, no, no. I boost my energy when I sit down and eat at breakfast and at lunch. And when I choose to exercise. That's how I boost my energy. You people boost it with all these chemicals and all of these things. After the audit, my colleagues would be down for at least three days, all of them. Couldn't come to work. Their bodies have shut down. And I would be the only one who reports for work. And they say, ah, why are you the only one who's here? I said, it's because of the foolishness of how I'm eating. You people are saying I eat like a rabbit, right? And you people are saying, you know, uh, all of these things are missing out. Yeah, it's because I'm missing out that I'm here. <laughs> and all my colleagues are not here. Are we together, friends? So even caffeine is, 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 is not a good drug. I don't have time to explain it, of course, scientifically. If you want that explanation, we can sit down and talk about it some other time. Um, another big one is uh, all forms of tobacco. Tobacco is a big problem. Yeah, you're saying you're at Helderberg. I know. Don't worry. I'm talking about these things, and I know I'm at Helderberg. My GPS did not drop me in the wrong place. I know. Tobacco is a big problem. Marijuana, even worse. You know, some scientific studies have actually shown that the effects of marijuana have uh, on the brain, is that it can cause permanent damage to your brain that affects your intellectual abilities for life. Meaning your, your, your memory loss is not only, you don't only forget things while you are high or while you are lifted, as we would say when I was in that world at that time, uh, 2000 and something BC. Um, <laughs> you don't, it's, not, it's not that you forget only when you are high, but even when the high feeling is gone, your ability to remember things is affected. So marijuana is a big problem. And all other illicit drugs, cocaine, um, I know that marijuana is not, no longer what it was when I used to smoke it, so you won't be arrested for it. But just because something is legal doesn't mean that it's good. Yeah. Because politicians don't make decisions that are good a lot of the times. They look, make decisions that are popular. Yeah. So anyways, I said it. Sorry. Um, then alcohol. Yeah, alcohol. You know that there are neuroscientists and some psychologists and other scientists who are actually discovering that the best amount of alcohol for people to drink, and I'm talking about uh, non-Adventist ones like Jordan Peterson, 
um, and, 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 and um, other like neuro, neuroscientists, the ones who study the brain and that's their work. They say that the best amount of alcohol for you to drink is 0%. Zero percent. Zero alcohol. Yeah, and, and, and they say that whatever benefit that you get from drinking wine is offset completely by the negative impact of wine on your brain, on the rest of your health. Because alcohol is a poison. And as soon as it enters your bloodstream, by the way, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and alcohol actually affects every cell of your body. Yeah. It affects every cell of your body. Yeah. That's why Adventists have been teetotalers, meaning we promote total abstinence from alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I know my... Uh, my theology student friends will, may debate me on this, yeah. My first, my first day at work, I had a debate with uh, one of my colleagues about the issue of alcohol and the Bible. But I'm not talking about that now, I'm just talking from a health perspective, all right? Yeah, if you want your brain to be in good health, stay away from alcohol, stay away from drugs, stay away from nicotine, and stay away from caffeine. Your brain would be happy. You show me one person who has made a better person by drinking alcohol. I'll quit my job. And you have to prove that that person was made a better person by drinking alcohol. And I posit to you that even that person who is successful but also drinks alcohol would probably be even more successful if they didn't drink alcohol and they didn't use drugs and all of these things. So, may God bless you. There are many other things um, I could talk about. Entertainment television, um, I could talk about that, but I don't have time, and I don't want to make too many enemies. You need to uh, make enemies in, 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 in good uh, measures so that you, you don't make everyone your enemy. But if you want to succeed in life, make good choices today. If you make good choices today, they will benefit you in the future. And don't say I'm young, I'm still fresh and all of this. The earlier you start making good choices, the more you will benefit from those good choices. I will be praying for you and for your exams, but I will pray more for you that you make good choices that will make your life easier later on in your life, even beyond Helderberg College for the rest of your life. These things, when I came into the Seventh-day Adventist Church and I learned them, they revolutionized my life. They changed my outlook on the world, and they have benefited me tremendously. And I thank God for the health message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I shared with you the last time I was here the history of my family in terms of lifestyle diseases. And they are saving me, these principles, from the same lifestyle diseases that have taken my mother, my father, my sister, and other members of my family. May God bless you. Amen. I hope that uh, you are able to take the, the, the knowledge, the experiences, and the, the insights that have been shared with you and apply them to your life. Um, there is wisdom in taking knowledge and applying it. But a fool scorns the knowledge that is shared with them. And I think God's, um, God's will for your life is shared with us in his word, when he says that it is his desire that your health would be well. Because only when your health is well, you can really enjoy all the other aspects of your life. So thank you for coming through this morning. I want to thank Pastor Postva for sharing with us his experiences, as well as um, his vast reading on the topic. I'd like to invite Pastor B to close this morning with, with a word of prayer. May I invite you to please stand? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, firstly and foremostly, we want to thank you for your manservant, Pastor Poswa, who has given this word of counsel. To some of us, this word has come as comfort. For others, it's come as conviction. And we just want to pray now, Father God, that we can make a right choice, good choices, 
a new start. So right now, Father God, we want to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We want to pray, Father, that you would help us to be disciplined so we can be effective in everything that we do. And now, Lord, as we look towards DP, due performance, there is a greater DP, there is divine providence, there is divine protection, there is divine perfection. And so we want to pray, Father God, that, uh, that you would come into our hearts today, that you would take full control of our lives, that you would be the overwhelming influence in our lives, and that we would be successful because we have submitted to the Savior. So bless each one, bless each lecturer, bless each learner, so that, Father, not only in the exam room we will do well, but it will be a result of our disciplined time, the things that we choose to do and the things that we choose not to do. Bless us now, Father God, for your glory is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.